All right, so I'm, I'm going live now. You ready? Yep. Okay. Pull up your. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Aaron McCune. Aaron, are you ready to be great today? Uh, we are going to be great. Thanks. Aaron is a founder and CEO of EaseNet out of Portland, Oregon. She's a bootstrap and, and has self-funded EaseNet for nearly three years. She recently won the Tire Oregon Boot Pitch Competition and was selected as a finalist for the two-minute drill on Amazon Prime Video. We're, we're going to do a deep dive on that later. So, Aaron, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So, Aaron, um, what do you focus on right now? Uh, building EasyNet out. Um, you know, being a CEO is is a lot, especially when when you're very small and bootstrapped. So, we have a we have a small team of about five, and uh, focusing on both growing our customer base and uh, just starting the process of fundraising. So. And not to be too personal, yeah. but but you're a single mother, right? I am. And I can't imagine, like, I mean, most people like that married. <laughs> most people like, you know, 24 years old, single, no kids, no responsibility. Parents give them, like, house place to live, $200,000 a year. But, like, I can't imagine the, the different challenges of being a single mother. Can you yeah. talk about that? Absolutely. I mean, you're constantly having to focus on balancing, taking care of of your the person that's the most important in your life, right? Which is your kid <laughs> as well as your, your yourself and what I call kind of my, my new baby, right? Easy net. Um, it, it's a lot to, be, to manage. And, and a lot of it is um, making sure that, that my daughter knows that she's still the very most important thing in my life at all times and that she's taken care of. Um, and, and it's a lot of late nights, which is okay. I have to imagine the, um... What we're looking for, the environment your daughter's in, all the stuff she's learning just by observing you, right? Even if she's not interested in it or like really paying attention, just the fact she's watching you, you know, doing what you're doing has to be like, a, you know, a good thing for her, right? Absolutely. I mean, you know, it, I had a lot of guilt when I was younger as a working mom and a single mom, but then you start to see the articles and the studies that have come out about the number one predictor of success for your children is seeing their parents succeeding and and seeing uh their parents thriving in in their job and um and then and then that helps a little bit with the with the parental guilt right yeah i'm sure you get some of that too right <laughs> of course like man i gotta help my daughter my homework or this is play whatever if i have this meeting yeah that's to be a delicate challenge. balancing act there's no doubt and i think it's usually the sleep that loses out the most yeah. unfortunately and, and your daughter is how old is she again she just turned 14. so she kind of understands you know so she kind of she does gets, like she knows a big picture she knows this for you know yeah it's not like she's four years old and oh mommy missed something right absolutely absolutely well and i was very fortunate when she was younger i was in outside sales and so i was able to set my schedule pretty much uh and and so I was able to work around some of the things that were important to her, whether it was volunteering at her school, which I did once a week, whether it was going on some of the field trips, you know, I, I was able to prioritize some of that. And now she's getting into her teenage years where she'd rather not see me half the time. Yeah, people so, so yeah. it works out okay. People don't realize that. Like when they're young, they want to be around the time. Once at a certain age, it's like mom who, dad who, like. Yeah. Like drop me off like six blocks away or, you know. Exactly. <laughs> Pretend you don't know me at all, please. <laughs> so next over your sales background, you have a pretty yeah. intensive and, and um, um, successful sales background. Can you talk about that? Sure. And specifically, is there a difference or what is the difference between SaaS sales and like just real estate regular sales? Sure. Um, so, you know, anytime you're talking about software sales, if you're doing it right, it's definitely more of a consultative, you know, you're making sure that you're aligning what the person's buying. Um, you know, if you talk about like a retail sales, for example, generally it's up to the customer to come in, look at what's there and, and make a decision. Sometimes you help with some information, but when you're talking about software sales, typically you're needing to, and, and I think you probably know yeah. this too, right? You need to delve in a lot more and understand their needs and what they're going for so that you can make the best recommendation for them because oftentimes they won't know it for themselves a lot of education mm -hmm. absolutely and so um one thing on your profile or somewhere i read like you're real proud of like most sales teams have turnover like you know 
10,000 percent, you know, <laughs> or just apply exaggeration. <laughs> and yours is like less than 50 percent. How did you like how do you pull that off? Yeah. So when I was at Integra for for several years there, the other sales teams in the market were over 100 uh, percent per year turnover. So their entire the equivalent of their entire team turned over in a year. Um, and, and I think I lost three people in three years or, or right about that. Um, and, and a lot of it comes down to recognizing what, you know, when, when you're really making sure that people feel appreciated and, and when you're making sure that whatever is important to them, whatever drives them and, and keeps them engaged, that you're focused on that and, and making sure that they're feeling taken care of. So few people do that. So few. I mean, the military, severe and disorder, yeah. there's always like drive, drive, drive. But what's driving that person, right? One of exactly. the different needs. Exactly. Like, what do you find drives you? I just have a new drive focus, you know, like, I mean, some people, I don't say have it or don't have it. Like some people just have a drive, right? Like, yeah. I retired from the military. People like, just sitting on the porch. Like, I can't do it, right? I'd, I'd go back to crazy. <laughs> I have, I've always done something extra, right? I've always done something, something else, right? Yeah. Well, not everybody, you know, sets up a, a beautiful <laughs> space here and, uh, and interviews people. I think that's great. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. So back to the sales, like, like, like in, in college, you know, there's like degrees in marketing, degree in regular business, <laughs> but I could be wrong. There's no such thing as a degree in sales, right? There have started to be some organizations that that have put something together. I would say probably 95% or more of the people that you see in sales did not get a degree in sales. My degree was in biology of all things from Reed. Um, you know, I worked on my last year of college, I worked on cloning a, a tiny piece of frog DNA right near the, the ends of the chromosomes. And and then got out and I was like, oh, that's what lab techs make. Yeah, I can't live on. That. <laughs> <laughs> I can't pay my student Oops. loans on that. I yeah. Just waited oh, four years. Oh. Um, and and so I wound up in sales, right? And um, so what drove the sales? Does the ability to make more money based on the amount of work you did, or? Well, at first, I I graduated with my biology degree, and I'm thinking, okay, I can't make enough going and and working in the lab. So what am I going to do? And I thought, okay, well, I can go do pharmaceutical sales. That kind of ties in my biology degree. And I like working with people. And I didn't necessarily like eight hours in the lab all day anyway. Um, but, of course, they wouldn't hire me until I had sales experience. Of course. Right. <laughs> so it's like, okay, now I have to go find, quote, unquote, sales experience somewhere. Um, I wound up at a uniform rental company, Unifirst. And so was in um, places where uh, like automotive shops and manufacturing and all these different places selling uniform rentals for about 18 months and then got recruited to Integra Telecom. And I spent about nine years uh, there in a variety of roles. So you just worked your way up the sales leadership platform, so to speak? Yeah, I uh, was in direct sales. I was in um, a sales training a uh, role for about 18 months that they had just created uh, and then uh, was was a sales manager for about three and a half years. Um, so what makes someone a good salesperson? Well, two part question. Like when you were interviewing with salespeople, like how long does it take you to figure out, okay, this person is going to make it or not make it? Yeah. And I think the stereotype, you know, if you're an extrovert with an extra capital E, you're going to be a great salesperson. How true <laughs> is that or not true is that? I think it depends on on how you handle being an extrovert. I think there are extroverts that are not good salespeople because all they want is just to talk to people and and part of their extroversion is is needing to please people all day long. I I think the best salespeople want to be in service to their clients, but not necessarily completely a people pleaser. Because I think there's sort of that point where you cross over into being the puppy dog and and not being able to manage that sales process in a way that you're really serving the highest good of both your client and the company that you work for. So what's the national career progression for a salesman? Like a junior salesperson, middle of the salesperson, like, is it based on like revenue? Like, of course I know every company is different, but yeah, based on your experience. Um, I think if you, if you're looking to get into SaaS, especially um, a good place to start can be a business development role. And typically that's going to be on the phones all day. So you, you kind of get beat up a lot uh, <laughs> you know a lot. You gotta think, think skin. and hung up on a lot. Right. Um, and, and a lot, 
I think a lot of sales is learning not to take things personally and learning that that timing is is everything. And and as long as you stick it out and you keep going and you keep focusing on what you're doing and you're doing it the right way and and in you know with a good heart, you're gonna get there. You're gonna find the success. Um, I don't think I've ever worked with a salesperson that that came from that perspective and and had the water off a duck's back perspective where they could just roll with it and and accept hang up after hang up and no after no and and still keep coming back um as long as as long as you're in that space and and I and that's why I think business development is a great place to start is there is there a difference between business development and sales yeah I mean business development is really just getting someone to say yes I'm willing to talk to someone yes I'm interested in talking with someone right that's the only place you're really getting them to and and then and then sales usually takes over from that point, which is okay. Now let's look at what are you doing today? What do you care about? What's important to you? You know, is there an alignment between what I sell and and what your needs are? Yes or no? And and then working through that process all the way to um, the yeah, completion. Part of that's just like doing your so called research, right? Like you don't want to send like a mass start calling us a, a list of companies without like without doing your research, right? Yeah. Or, I mean, so that's that's on marketing, do that right versus sales, or is it both? I'd say it's on both. You know, I I think the best sales people are really going to understand who is um, their ideal customer, right? What is the ICP, their ideal customer profile? If you if you have your very very best customers and you can identify all the qualities of that person or that buyer, and then and then you're spending the majority of your time going after that target it's it's like always aiming at the bullseye all the time right sometimes yeah. you'll you'll wind up outside the bullseye but you're you you have a much higher likelihood of success if you're constantly aiming directly at that bullseye some of follow up like some people say like follow up two or three times other people say follow up but you get a no of course we all know like maybe is the worst answer right like from your, from your point of view and your experience like how often should someone follow up before they like okay i'm not calling this person no more <laughs> Um, I think generally six or seven times, you know, especially with how busy everyone is, but you know, if, if all you're doing is sending an email, that's like, Hey, I'm just following up. Hey, I'm just following up. That gets annoying real quick, Mm -hmm. you know, find ways to deliver value, right? Maybe there's an article that relates to that person. Um, maybe there's something going on in, in their life that you happen to know about, you know, it's their birthday or their take, you know their daughter's going off to college or, you know, whatever the case may be, deliver value when mm-hmm. you approach, when you approach someone and when you're doing that follow-up and it's going to go much further than just, um, <laughs> just following up for the sake of following up yeah, right? I mean, and checking on your money, if you will. Yeah. We already got the stuff on like, either LinkedIn or, e- or email. Hey, Hey Jason, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, you look through it's like 10,000 words and you know, like, what is this? Mm-hmm. And like, sometimes, you know, if you're polite, you go back, Hey, I'm not interested. I have an internal team doing this. And that mm-hmm. I kill me to get a reply. Well, I'm pretty sure my, my, my team is better than your team. Hire us on. Right. Or like, or <laughs> not like exactly like that, but worse those effect. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I finally, um, I think it was about six months ago. There was a thing going around, um, about how, if you put a, an emoji of some kind at the that, start yeah. of your name, then it makes it much easier to identify what are the auto messages that come in yeah. from other people. Uh, so if you look at my profile, I have a little sunflower in front of my E and it, it makes it a little easier to to spot some of the people that are <laughs> reaching out on an, on an automated basis yeah. versus a true personal basis. That's true. So let's talk about your, 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 your time at open Sesame. Mm-hmm. What, what, what is that? Right there. Yeah. So Open Sesame is an ed tech company. Uh, I joined them when we were at, gosh, 25 or 30 people. Uh, they had me come in to build out their sales team and develop some sales process. And um, it was right after they got their Series A funding. And, and so I was with them for seven years um, in, you know, sales leadership, partnership and, and some direct sales capacities and, and but you're not long, no longer with them right because you're working your own stuff correct yeah um i'm focused on using it now yeah so how do you become how did you become so passionate about tech oh 
that? What, what started that? That's a great question. I think because at my core, what drives me is creating optimized solutions. You know, the most efficient, the most elegant, the most optimized solutions. And and that's what what gets me excited is is when everything's flowing exactly the way it 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 can possibly be the best it can be. Um, and a lot of times technology has solutions for that, right? To, to make things more efficient. You know, this morning I went, um, you know, I'm, I'm up in Seattle for the weekend, as you know, and, uh, my best friend is, is fairly close up here. And so we said, Hey, let's just make dinner tonight. And so before I ever left home, I was able to find a recipe online I was able to order everything at the QFC near the hotel we're staying at. And then this morning, you know, you click a button, you're like, okay, I'm on my way. And you show up and you park in the thing and they bring your groceries and set it in your trunk and you're off and running, right? Um, to me, that that's using technology in a way that, that now you've streamlined an entire workflow that previously could have taken you how long to flip through recipe books, find a recipe, you know, try to carve out time to go to the grocery store, pick out exactly what you need. And, you know. So why do you think so many people, and this might be the wrong term, but why are so many people still quote unquote scared of tech, you know? I think anytime there's change, of course, change is always uncomfortable. So people who didn't grow up with technology, it can feel uncomfortable at first. Uh, and, and people don't like to feel dumb. So if you pick up a new piece of technology and you're trying to figure it out, if the if the flow isn't obvious, if there are things that catch catch you up a little bit and, and you get stuck, you're either going to get frustrated or you're going to feel kind of dumb. And and then that's going to be an uncomfortable feeling. Yeah, that's a good point. I think so many tech people that is inter what's the word intuitive to them, mm -hmm. but it's not intuitive to other like quote unquote normal people, right? Right. You know, like <laughs> oh, it's just push this button. Like I don't even see the button. Like this, this, this is the flow, right? That flow, like someone like that flow makes no sense. Like the flow might make sense to you, but someone like has no tech not background. Like you know, what is this, right? Well, and and even people that are just very busy and distracted, right? You're like, okay, click the the button in the middle, the green one, and and it still takes them some time. And then they're suddenly feeling uncomfortable and frustrated. dumb, right? They're, they're like, oh, why can't I see the green button? And then they see it and it is right in front of them. And that that doesn't help anything no. because then they're feeling like, oh. And that's one thing I learned about dealing with tech. Like once you figure out, you're like, crap, that's it. Like, <laughs> like it's, that was, that's all I do. Like, like one plus one doesn't equal two, right? Like it's so simple. Like once you figure it out, you're like, you do feel kind of dumb. Like how come I, how come it took me like three hours to figure this out? Yeah. The answer is right here. Well, I, I was working in tech when, when cloud became a buzzword and started to become big. And for a long time, you know, you talk about the cloud and people get very confused. Mm -hmm. They're like, what, what are we, what are we talking about? And, you know, there are people to this day that are like the cloud and they point up and, <laughs> Yeah. And you're like, no, no, not, not the actual cloud, not the actual clouds. Um, and I, I get where they, where they thought cloud would be the way to, the way to describe it, because most of those guys, you know, when, when you look at telecom, there was the public switch telephone network, right. Which is how all the phone calls have gone for a long, long time. And it's, it's a group of servers that, that navigate phone calls. And, and it was always, when you drew it, it was always like a cloud okay. in, in these diagrams. That's just kind of how it was. I don't know how it started that way. But then when you look to the internet and you started to see these same clusters of servers and everything, then it, of course, seemed natural to be like, oh, yeah, that's the cloud. That's the internet cloud. Makes, I mean, makes sense. Right. But for everybody else that wasn't in that world, didn't know what the PSTN is, you know, the public switch telephone network, didn't know how that system operated in the first place you're like okay yeah so all the internet is going to be a cloud and you're like uh <laughs> so rain comes from clouds so is this going to rain down on us exactly you, you mean it's just kind of ethereal and it doesn't really exist i mean you know and and then and then of course security becomes this oh, yeah. big question because you you talk about a cloud and it seems like okay well that can't be safe no oh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> There's no way to secure stuff there. Right. So 
you did a post today or yesterday or I mean pretty recently where mm-hmm. you took your team to uh, some kind of winery, right? Yeah. Yeah. It seemed like a lot of fun. Of course, wine, anytime wine is a while, it'll be fun. <laughs> but what's, talk about the importance of doing stuff like that with your team or for your team. Absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, we're all people, right? And And I think that community is such a big part of who we are as people. And, and there's different ways that we form community for sure. Um, a lot of us have had to create online communities, especially in the last 16 months when (laughs) it's kind of hard to do a winery over zoom. Exactly. I mean, people have done it, right. I've, I've seen a lot of like, Oh, we're doing virtual wine tasting. And you're like, that's not quite the same, but you know, I appreciate the effort. Um, but yeah, it was so great to, now that everyone's vaccinated, be able to go and it was outside and it was sunny, but, but just having those opportunities to really connect one-on-one and, and be able to have those conversations that have nothing to do with work. Yeah. That's so, those are so important that people don't get that. Yeah. So how do you deal with the situation if you have or have not, like you have like, I think you said like five people that work with you. Mm-hmm. So you have this like big event plan. You're going to go to the winery again next month. Four people like then they're like really not going to park the performing great. The fifth person, not so much, right? Like he's like, like you're, you're actually thinking about getting rid of this person, right? Because they're not performing well. Mm-hmm. Do you still all take them to this, to this event? Do you like kind of separate it? Like how do you deal with that? Like I would always take someone with us, you know? I mean, in sales especially, right? I mean, I think in any role, if you're a good manager, your employees know whether or not you're happy with their work or you're not. Um, I, I feel like employees should always know where they stand. Um, sales that makes it kind of easy because it's numbers, right? You, you either are hitting your number or you're not hitting your number. And if you're not hitting your number, you know it as well as everybody else does. Um, there should never be a surprise. Like I've, you know, of course I've had to fire people in my career. Um, but we pretty much always parted on, on good terms because they knew that I had supported them to the level that I possibly could and that they had done what they could do to, to bring in the numbers and it just didn't happen. And, you know, they had advanced notice and I, you know, I remember one time one of my employees was waiting, there was like one deal that she was waiting to come in. And if the deal came in before noon, then she got to stay. And if it didn't, then we had to let her go. Um, and and I'm like, well, let's not just sit around the office. Like, let's go down and get breakfast burritos. And so yeah. we went down and got breakfast burritos and, you know, waited. And and then, like I said, we parted friends. We had a good conversation. And um, I think including people no matter what, it's either going to boost them up from where they are and, and get them fired up and wanting to participate more. Or they're just going to recognize, oh, this isn't really the right place for me. And they're going to go find a place where they can be successful. So can you talk about how hard or easy it is to fire someone? Because people are like, they think, oh man, it's so easy to fire someone. It, it's really <laughs> the, the person getting fired is really one like taking all the, you know, all the pressure, but it's really like the manager, right? I mean, it's, I think it's hard on everybody. Um, un, unless you're, I mean, I think if you have, have, have a level of empathy, it's going to be difficult on you as the manager. If you have no em- empathy, maybe you can just like, be like, like, you're, like you're, bye. Yeah, like you're, if you're, if you're, you if you're, if you're, yeah, if you're like Doss Bader, J.R. Ewing, you have no right. problem getting rid of people. <laughs> but um, again, I, I don't think when you fire someone, I don't think it should ever be a surprise to them. Yeah, that's a good you point. Know? And, and if it is a surprise to them, you know, either there was something super egregious that happened, mm-hmm. right? And it is what it is. But, but more likely, um, they, they know it's coming, you know, and, and you can handle it in a way that that's kind and, um, and as supportive as possible under the circumstances, right? But it's still going to be hard on you as the manager, because you've invested time in this person, you believed bringing them into this role that they were going to be successful. Um, you know, that's why I always feel super bad for the managers when there's rifts, right? Reduction in force and, and it's outside of the manager's control altogether. You know, they're like, oh, go let these people go. You know, then it's really hard because you you know that these people have been part of your team. You brought them on because they could do a good job and, and there may have been no deficiencies in their in the work that they were doing, but you still have to let them go. 
Fortunately, I've never had to go through that. I, I think I would take that really hard, but I always feel for the managers that are in that spot. I know one thing, like people always say like, um, hire slow, fire fast. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think anyone fires fast, right? Cause like, it's always like, like you said, oh, it's their birthday, it's Christmas, or it's, it's on me, you know, I don't think anybody really fires fast, do they? Unless it's like something like they have like something like egregious, like they do something like, okay, I, you have to leave now, right? Yeah, I, I think, I think the good managers maybe don't fire super fast, but they also don't fire slow because firing too slow affects your entire team. Cause everyone, I, everybody I, sees that that person yeah. is not doing what they need to do. And yeah. then, and then they're sitting there wondering, okay, well, why are they still here? Yeah. Why should I keep performing at my optimal? Exactly. If this person is just dead weight and they're allowed to stay. So they wonder, by the time you figure out this person is to go, the whole organization is known for a little while. Mm -hmm. And they're waiting for you, like, okay, what are you going to do? Like, yeah. Well, and, and some of that process, of course, is invisible, or it should be invisible to your team, right? Yeah, when you put someone on a performance improvement mm -hmm. plan and you're saying, okay, <laughs> you know, here's the expectations, here's what it's going to take for you to get to stay. And, you know, your team shouldn't see any of that. So from their perspective, there should be whatever, 30 days or however long that they think think that nothing's happening when in fact underneath it all something is happening but you know it it's it's when it drags on for six months seven months eight yeah. months or longer right and and everyone on the team knows this person's not the right person especially when other people the team were doing that person's job right makes it even worse well and if a team has a quota for example on a sales team right then in order for the team to make quota if one person isn't doing their part of it then yeah absolutely but that's true i mean like you said on pretty much any team anywhere it's going to be someone has to pick up the slack somewhere because the work doesn't stop so back to sales real quick yeah from your from your experience is it better to like have like someone like do sales like straight commission straight salary or comment some kind of combination with salary and commission uh typically you're gonna get better salespeople if you can provide a blend um, in most cases, you know, it depends what, what's being sold or what the sales model is. Um, a lot of times it's going to depend on how long of a sales cycle it is. If you have a sales cycle that's less than one month, it's going to be less important to give someone a ramp period and, and make sure that they're kept whole while they grow their business. But a lot of software sales can be six months, nine months, or even longer. So you know, going back to the higher slow <laughs> piece, right? You know that that even a good salesperson is probably going to take a year and sometimes 18 months before they're really getting up to speed and, and performing at, at a good level. So you need to know as best as you can, right? Is that the right person? And, and how is that going to happen? If you have somebody that, that has commission only, and you're talking about a nine month sales cycle, well, they wouldn't see any income for nine months. So that's just not sustainable. Yeah, unless, right? unless, you're gonna, unless you're gonna move them to your house or something. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> unless you're providing housing and food and uh, I don't know companies to do that. So uh, I, I think most of the time you at least need to have say a 50, 50, right. Where, where 50% of their overall expected compensation is a base salary and 50% is, is their at risk comp. Um, and, and even then, if it's a longer sales cycle, you're going to want to have some kind of a ramp where, where they, they can get some of that commission, you know, cause most people can't live on 50% of their expected salary. You know, you, you ask, I don't know, a hundred people off the street, Hey, could you live, live, you know, and, and make everything work on 50% of, of what you make today? Most people are going to look at you like you're crazy. So so next, um, you're currently bootstrapping your company. Yes. Can you talk about the challenges of that and like why, why bootstrapping <laughs> like versus, and let's talk about how you're going to switch from bootstrapping, bootstrapping to eventually fundraising. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, of course, you know, like, like any startup anywhere, we thought development, development was going to take less time than, than it has. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to whatever, your, whatever timeline is like this going to times it by 10 or something. You right, know? pretty much. Um, 
And, and so, you know, part of it was just, you, you, you get going and then you just keep feeding that engine and feeding that engine. And then you look back, you're like, oh, wow, that's more than I realized I'd, <laughs> um, but you know, it, it's a lot easier to raise money, of course, once you have a product and once you have some, some traction, um, you know, we've been fortunate that, that we're at that place now where we do have a product and it's in market and we do have some traction. Um, we've just kind of started that fundraising process. So my first day on open Sesame exclusively was at the start of April. So it's been about six weeks now. Um, we've been fortunate. Uh, we're in, we, we made the semifinals for Seattle angel conference. Um, we unfortunately didn't make the finals, but we are also in the finals for Oregon Angel Tech, and we'll find out next Friday if we got that, and that's a $125,000 investment. So that, you know, we're we're hoping that that comes through. Um, you, you mentioned we are also in the finals for a uh, two-minute drill, and then um, we're also, we were one of the four uh, finalists for GSV boot camp, and that uh, hope we're it, it puts us in the running for a spot on the show Meet the Drapers that comes with some crowdfunding investment as well. And then, of course, you know, in addition to everything else I'm doing, I'm starting to talk to VCs and investors, so it's a lot. So, as an entrepreneur, you're doing a great job putting yourself out there, right? Doing pitch competitions, all this kind of stuff. Yeah, why is it important to do this? Uh, well, if you want to raise money, uh, <laughs> it, you know, assuming that you don't already have a strong network of friends and family with money, or you have run a company before and come out the other side and, and you already have good connections with all the investors, this is how people see, how do you do, you know, what do you look like? How do you present? How do you come across? How do you tell your story? both your story and your company's story. Um, and can you do that succinctly and powerfully, right? Um, and, and that's what's going to get the interest and the notice of, of the investors that are out there. Um, it's also just great um, publicity for the company in general. Yeah, great branding too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Do you, do you think entrepreneurs do this, do this enough? I think a lot of them do do it to the extent that they can. Um, you know, as a single mom, especially I've learned to be very efficient with my time <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I process information very quickly, which I'm very fortunate, um, to, to be able to do. And so I can scan a lot of information in a relatively short period of time. Um, and, and I do my best to figure out, okay, where is my time going to be best served? Where are my efforts going to be used to their highest good? Because I think that when, when you, again, going back to what drives me, right, optimizing solutions, when you optimize what people are doing with their time and how they're driving to success and use that to its highest good, that's how a company is going to be able to be the most successful. Um, and, and certainly, you know, if you, if, if you rewound the clock and you go back 20 years and I'm about to turn 22, right, do I understand what necessarily is my highest good? Do I understand where my time can be utilized at, at its most optimal? I don't know that I would at 21, right? So, so for new entrepreneurs that are much younger and they're, they're just coming out of college or even still in college and, and building a business. I mean, more power to them. I think it's awesome that they're doing it, but they, they face that additional hurdle of figuring out, okay, how do I, what am I best at and how do I best spend my time? So it's already, already hard enough to raise funds, right? I think only 1% of the company actually raise money. Mm -hmm. And if you raise money, it's no guarantee you're going to be successful. I mean, the odds are stacked out to you. Yeah. But as a female founder, it's even more stacked against you. I'm, I think we're saying, if there's like three male founders for every million, a uh, three female founders team relates like half that amount, right? So how do you work through the challenges of that and all, and all that kind of stuff uh, that you have to deal with? <laughs> it's a tough one, right? I mean, the last reporting that I saw, it was 2.2% of all funding, I think, went to, to female founders, which, you know, that that's a pretty big stack against you at that point, right? Um, 
but but you have to use that as fuel to fuel your power, you know, your passion and and be like, okay, now I know what I'm up against. I know I have to work 45 times harder to get the dollars. All right, let's go do that. Um, and, and I think there are funds out there that recognize the power of female founders and, and that, um, you know, the research backs it, the, that the female founded companies are more likely to return positive returns. Um, they're, they're in, in most cases more likely to be successful. And maybe that's just because they're rarely funded. So the ones that are funded are really good, but, um, there, there are some great, uh, advocates out there at this point for underrepresented founders and, and, you know, you mentioned that I went through Founder Gym and and just graduated from that. That's a program really designed for underrepresented founders, so um, females and and um, black and indigent and people of color, right? All these founders that that are amazing, amazing people and have these awesome companies, um, but no one helps them understand how to raise money. And so it's it's a six week, seven week process where you get to hear from really, really incredible uh, teachers and speakers and and learn some of these pieces to to be able to go out and and successfully raise. So once you go all in on fundraising, are you gonna focus on Portland, Seattle, going to the Bay Area? Like what, what can you tell us what like what locations you're gonna try to target? Yeah. Um, obviously, as much as I can keep the money in, in the Pacific Northwest, I'd love to just because, you know, this is home for me, right? This is where I grew up. This is where I've been my whole life. Um, but there are some uh, investors doing some really cool stuff with silver tech, with age tech, right? And, and that kind of falls in line with, with EasyNet um, and, and our target market being a little bit older. Um, and and certainly if if I work with some of the funds that focus on that, then the likelihood is, is that they have other portfolio companies that could be good uh, partners for me or give me good insights. And, you know, there, there could be advantages to going that way as well. And have you started fundraising yet or is that in the future? I've talked to an, a number of investors, um, you know, it's it. I've heard that first time fundraising typically takes six to 12 months. Um, and, and so, you know, we, not, we've not, got not, a little ways to not, go. Not, not big at all, huh? Not big at all. <laughs> right. Um, and of course, always here, you need more traction. Yes. Oh, are, right. Are you really interested? I want to get more traction. Or is that your way of saying no? Exactly. Have you figured out a way to, to sort out which one's which? No, no, no. <laughs> I have not. I'm not that smart yet. <laughs> there should be an app for that, right? <laughs> there should be, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, I I think that that like anything, you know, I I know how to go out and get my teeth kicked in and and go out and hear no a lot. Uh, and, I think that's definitely advantage you have over an entrepreneur. You have the sales experience. Yeah, and it's just a sales like a sales process, right? You got to do the CRM. You like. I'll make this number. I suppose it's like 10,000 investors. You go through, okay, they're B2B, they're B2C, they're A round, they're B round. Exactly. They only invest in people in California. So you just start knocking them off. And you have list maybe 100 left. Okay, I'm not connecting any of them, but these 50, I'm connected, second connection with this a great connection, right? And this got to work. It's, yeah. Well, and it helps, right? Because I have, I think, I don't know, 1,700 connections on LinkedIn or something like that, which isn't an insane amount, but you think about the number of secondary connections yes. that that opens up. Um, it's pretty extensive. So um, it, it definitely helps. And, and people who know me over the years, they know my heart, they know my why, mm -hmm. they know that I am truly committed and passionate about this and they want to see me succeed. And so they will help with introductions wherever they mm -hmm. can, you know, whether it's an introduction to estate planners or an introduction to someone who could be an angel investor. Mm -hmm. So. So next, let's talk about two minute pitch. With yeah. David Metzger. I want to hear your story. Yeah. Man. <laughs> so when, so when were you on there? Uh, so our episode airs in June. So next month. Okay. Well, I was the same one then. Oh, you were? Yeah. Okay. I'm a finalist too for that one. So. So for those who don't know, Devin Metzer, um, 
he's like he's like a big time business coach. Yeah. Um, he co owns uh, some kind of sports market company, Warren Moon, real famous. It was the one that uh, that Jerry Maguire was based on, right? Yeah. 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 And like, and for those, of course, everyone knows who Gary Vaynerchuk is. At least, hopefully, you do. <laughs> yeah. So when I do my pitch deck, I say that Gary that um, David Metzger, my board advisor, is Gary Vaynerchuk's business advisor, right? Mm-hmm. So I do that. So originally. I was on it back in September. It's like his first episode he did, like, you know, big time. I, got, I finished second, right? Nice. And I was able to uh, parlay that to be uh, being him being my board of advisors. Oh, wow. So fast forward to March, it's like on live TV or whatever, you, you know, so I'm on there. Yeah. And so, like, I like I said, like, doing pitches, like, same like doing a resume, right? Mm-hmm. You, you can show your resume, like, 25 different people and get 25 different opinions. Yeah. You do a pitch, like, 25 different people to 25 different reasons. Like, so where's the pitch? I did? Of course, the pitch changed a little bit. Back in September, I got to second place. And then, you know, like you, I do a lot of startup stuff. Mm-hmm. So I was part of this community called Pitch Bootcamp. And they did a thing called Pitch Bootcamp Elite Eight, the top eight company. So it was sponsored by Google for Startups, right? Basically, Google for Startups oh, ran nice. the program, right? Uh-huh. They had a pitch competition. And I did very well. I got a lot of compliments, right? You know, mm-hmm. and of course, that was like five minutes. Dave is like two minutes, right? Yeah. Exact same team. It pretty much the same thing, right? Same tone, whatever. I even w- w- watched both of them, right? Mm-hmm. To me, it's the same. And I got freaking blasted on David's right. Oh. Like I got like, <laughs> like you have no passion. What are you doing here? Like oh. somebody should do it right. I'm like, like what, what the fuck's going on here, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Just shows, and of course, you know, of course you're like down for a day, like, man, what the right. hell's going right? You see, and you gotta blow it off, right? Well, but David Metzler is is one of your advisors, right? Yeah. So you can have that conversation and yeah. be like, oh man. But he, like, he, he blasted me too. Did he? Yeah. Oh. Well, but then afterwards you can like have a sit yeah. down and be yeah. like, okay, so where do I improve it yeah right once, yeah. once you've taken a little time because i'm sure i would need a little time to like yeah soothe and, my ego yeah. <laughs> and the thing too like even i got blasted you know uh-huh. like i guess haven't really told us who's gonna be, who's gonna be the tv show uh-huh. at least haven't told me yet but the thing is even if it's the worst performance it's on tv who you know who's gonna see it right right and like the guy who like really blasted me i can't remember his name like he's like this like um i want to put this bad so like like this um, publicity person, like you show, he's like trying to do stuff, make himself look good, right? Mm-hmm. So that kind of played into his TV too, you know, but yeah, but it's, good, it's good publicity too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's kind of fun to be able to tell people that you'll be on Amazon Prime. Yeah, and... exactly. So I can repurpose a video and yeah. all that kind of stuff, right? And I know like, okay, and maybe I'm, I'm too hard on myself too, right? I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. You well, know, it's a good I, experience. I, that part of it is it's still reality TV, right? Yeah they have to hype whatever they were going to say normally yep. up. So they may come across down like they're totally blasting you. Whereas really they're like, uh, you know, he did, he did fine. And, and, and it, it did come off for like the guy who really blasted me. Like, you know, yeah. you're not passionate. But it, really it did come off like, like it was like film for TV. Right. Yeah. 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 It was a good experience. And nothing else. Like I'll be on TV, you know? Right. And like, it could be the more worst pitch forever. It might like someone might see it. Right. And connect it. Right. Absolutely. I, Your I, phone's going to be ringing off the hook. Yeah, not going like, Jason, come help us out. <laughs> <laughs> come show us what you're working on. So that's funny. We're both in the same month. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When was your? I I think I, it was March. That sounds about right. And because like, one guy was March. a it was David, the guy who blasted me. His name's Jason Fuller, I think. Okay. There was a lady on there, and there's someone else. Nice. I, I, I can remember the lady's name. I think it was a different day of recording okay. then. Okay. Because we didn't, I didn't have a female judge. Okay, I had uh, a female okay. judge. Okay. Was she the Senegens? I don't remember. Okay. Yeah, she was real supportive though. Oh, like, good. Yeah. yeah. It was almost like, you know, like, you know, what we called back in the day, American Idol, like Simon Cora would like blast everyone, Paul Abdul, like, oh, you're not, <laughs> you, you don't suck that bad. You're not that horrible. <laughs> <laughs> like I mean, yeah. like, like Jason got like blast everyone. Pretty much sort of concept of winner, and she would come along. Basically, like you're not that bad, you know. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. Really have, you, have you started getting some of the the prizes, the um, the the free stuff that they? Not they yet. Get? Okay. Not yet. Not yeah. yet. Yeah. I got I got the the first box. It was a, a box of juice. Nice. It was really delicious juice, though. Yeah, um, it was a good yeah. experience. Yeah, it was fun. And like, oh, and like, I'm a big believer in like winning Gretzky's like theory. You miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take, right? Oh, absolutely. Although it was really funny. So you know, I it, it it's two minutes that that you are and doing it, and it's like a, fast. it goes really fast. And the whole show is only like 30 minutes, but you're on the the recording for two hours. Yeah, or just whatever waiting. It is, right? And I remember like I did my two minute pitch, and then. 
maybe 10 minutes later, my, my Apple watch is going off. It's like your heart rate's been over a hundred, <laughs> <laughs> like over 130 beats a minute for the last 10 minutes. And it doesn't look like you're working out. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know. My heart's pumping. <laughs> Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Like if you would have told me like two years ago, even a year ago, I'd be like on a national TV show talking about my coming out. Like, yeah, get the heck, get out of here. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, cause I'm an introvert, <laughs> introvert, right? Like, no, there's no way yeah. I'm doing that right. Uh -huh. we, we learn and grow so much. Absolutely. It's was, it was a, it a good time though. Uh -huh. Definitely. How long learn. did you uh, practice your pitch? Forever. Yeah. Like when I did, when I first did it with them in September, when I finished second, I must have done at least like at least 50 times. Yeah. At, at least a minimum. Same thing this time, right? This, mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes you knock it out. Sometimes you strike out, right? Yeah. Did you finish in the two minutes? Oh, yeah. I, did. Okay. I finished the two minutes. Yeah. I finished the two minutes. Yeah. There was one. There was one guy in the in the filming. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but um, he didn't even use his full two minutes. Yeah. Like he stopped early, and they they gave September. him a bit of a hard time about yeah. that. Yeah, when I did September, this person did like in 45 seconds, <gasps> and he got really? destroyed. Yeah. Oh man, he got destroyed. Yeah, and me, I, both times I did it like 158, so right on there. So Perfect. That's when I practice. I really practice that time right. And it's kind of hard, like that. Even you like speed up talking or slow down talking. I'm mm -hmm. um, the clock's right there, so. so yep. Yeah. You're like, but, okay, I'm going to talk a little faster now. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like a, an auctioneer. A little bit. So do you have any, any, uh, uh pitch competition coming up? You're going to tell us about, you're going to be competing in or taking part in. So I, um, tech fest Northwest for angel Oregon tech is next Friday. We actually, um, recorded, we had one shot, one run through and they recorded that, uh, this last Tuesday. Um, and then we'll have, so they'll play our recorded pitches next Friday and then with some live Q&A. So the good news is I don't have to pitch live next Friday. <laughs> so the heat's off. Uh, but but then we do have live Q&A and then they announce who the winner is. Um, there's another one uh, that's a AARP Innovation Labs that I just applied for. Um, so how do you find all these opportunities? Like people ask me how you find these opportunities. I'll just say I Google it or I'll go to meetup.com or Eventbrite. Yeah. I mean, it's out there, right? You just got to take the time to figure it out, right? Some of that. And then I would say, you know, the more plugged in you can get into communities with other founders and, and other entrepreneurs, um, you know, I think I'm up to 11 different Slack groups at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe more. I've kind of lost count. Um, but, you know, it, again, it goes back to if you're giving... Um, you know, as, as you run across something and you share it with the people in your network, then you've now great, you know, you've, you're giving value first. I always mm -hmm. believe, you know, if you can give value first, that's a great place to be, but, but then the universe will then take care of you, right? Somebody else will see something and kick it back around to you, or you'll stumble across it or whatever. Um, so I think there is a certain amount of, um, if you know, you know, going back to that, um, bullseye you know what your ideal customer profile is, or you know what your best place to be is, then it's a lot easier to know where you should be showing up. So for me, you know, I really want to get EasyNet into AARP Innovation Labs because I know that that will be a great, great fit, great fit for us. Um, and, and so then it's a matter of, you know, cause I've met with the AARP partnerships team and they're like, Hey, we love what you're doing. You're just a little too early stage. So it's like, okay. Um, and, and so we have two different pathways right now into AARP innovation labs. One is through mass challenge accelerator, who's a feeder for AARP innovation labs. And so we're pitching the finals for, for that program, June 2nd. And then there's another one uh, that's more direct to AARP Innovation Labs, and that's in on July 1st. So first, who even knew AARP had an innovation arm? <laughs> like, <laughs> like. I, I will confess I did not before I founded EasyNet. <laughs> but, um, you know, of course, when, when you start talking about what we do and, and how we help people, of course, everybody's like, oh, you should go talk to AARP. Mm -hmm. And, and so you start looking at that and you start digging in and you're like, oh, they actually have a, an entire incubator for startups that, that I had no know. clue. Yeah. There you go. I had no idea. If you want to target the HR for, <laughs> I need to think about HR, everyone needs it. 
Um, it's true. They do. So you're in Portland, the Portland area, right? Yes. Can you talk some about the tech startup scene in Portland? Yeah, um, it's definitely growing. I wouldn't say it's quite as robust and mature necessarily as, as Seattle. Seattle has been at it a while. Um, but uh, Portland's done a nice job of, of encouraging that. Um, you know, the, the boot camp that I went through in Portland, the Thai, uh, Oregon, um, that, you know, that's really like a tech entrepreneur, uh, boot camp. Um, and, and there's, you know, a lot of groups, you know, women in technology and different things. I think Portland does what, what it can to start to facilitate that. Um, and, and it's a very, very tight knit community because Portland is really just, it's not a city. It's a small town that dresses up like a city. Right. Um, which, which I love about it. I'm not ripping on it, but, um, you know, there's what, 750,000 people in the, in the main part of the city. And even if you include all the suburbs, you're only talking at a million and a half. Um, and, and so it, it is a, it is a smaller community. It's a very tight knit community, but. Um, so like Seattle, we have Amazon, you know, mm-hmm. companies like that, you know, Bay Area is like all those, you know, all the stuff down there. What, what's in Portland? I don't know. Of course, Nike's, Nike's down there. Is there like tech company, big tech companies down there or? Intel. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Um, but other than that, it's a lot of uh, sportswear, right? We've got Columbia Sportswear. We've got Under Armour. We've got Nike. <laughs> we've got Adidas. Um, so, y- you know, the the community of tech companies for the most part is they all know each other right so don spear the the ceo of open sesame is is very very well connected and um you know i'm i'm grateful because he said look when when you're ready to fundraise i'll make some introductions for you be, because he is so tied in and and he does know that network really well so yeah that's great um what kind of like like here in Seattle? There's like Startup Grind, Seattle Angel Conference, Founders Live, all these verticals, right? Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's like, it's like they actually communicate with each other, right? Is it the same? They don't they, communicate, or they do? Like sometimes they like they don't, right? Okay. How's 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 the how's the like networking in Portland? Like, <laughs> so uh, Angel Oregon Tech is going to be part of Tech Fest Northwest, and this year it's actually a. a joint venture between Oregon Entrepreneurs Network and uh, and and uh, the Technology Association of Oregon, TAO. Um, so I, I think they realize that it doesn't make a lot of sense in Portland, just Portland being the size that they are, to have have them be disparate pieces. Mm-hmm. It makes a lot more sense to work together. And, and be able to leverage um, the strength of, of the organizations that are there to um, get more press, get more <laughs> attention, get, you know, where, whereas I think um, in Seattle, there's, it's easier for people to go and um, be be disparate and 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 have entire ecosystems around them that can su- support the more organizations just because Seattle is so much bigger. Yeah. Is is your team remote? Yes. Yeah. So how do you how do you like like figure out how to bring people on like the whole process for that? Yeah. So my co-founder and I of course um met before COVID and and we're working together before COVID. Um, our developer, um, had worked with my co-founder and CTO previously, so that was easier. Um, but when we went to, for example, um, get a marketing person, it was a matter of, of tapping into our networks and, and doing interviews over the phone and over zoom and, and selecting the best candidate. And then, and then, you know, Zoom makes it easier because you can show someone your screen and it's almost like sitting there together and, and looking at your computer and figuring it out. Um, but it is a different world, right? Working with people and having team members you've never met in person. Like someone joked on a podcast that I was on the other day, like they have no idea how tall or how short the people are. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and and so our, our security advisor that we brought on 
um, he is out in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And, and so we've only ever talked to him over phone and over zoom. We've never met in person. We, you know, we've started talking about it now that everyone's vaccinated, but it, it'll be interesting to start to bring people back together physically. That's going to be interesting dynamic. Uh-huh. My thing is like, you have companies that can say, Hey, everyone come back to work. People and it's like, okay, I already proven I can work better from home. I've increased all this RI. But you want me to come back to work? This this long commute, be around people don't like, might not like. You know, mm -hmm. that's gonna be interesting dynamic. I think. Yeah, it that that one's a really interesting conversation because I can definitely kind of see both sides because I absolutely think there's. I I don't think it's a statement on, the productivity of the people working at home as much, as I think there's there's a lot at least the argument that I've seen that that's been made is that for more junior members or people that need a little more help, they're not as able to get that quick interaction yeah. or just even hearing it in the background. So like, I'll give you an example. When I started in telecom, um, my desk just happened to be seated in the office directly in front of our two sales engineers you know, and the, and the pathway through the cubes was like right next to my desk. So people would walk down there, ask them a question and then go back to their desk. Right. And, and it was like this constant cycle. And it's not that I was consciously focused on that all day long, but you start to overhear, you start to hear the questions and the answers. And, and I feel like that built my knowledge much faster, just that ambient <laughs> yeah, you just miss it on that ambient knowledge being delivered constantly. Yeah, there's you know, something to be said thrift. about being in person. Yeah, um, but but I also definitely see you know people are getting so much more done at home and they're saving the commute time and they're saving you know so so I don't know where the balance is, but I think that um, finding a way to at least um, have some kind of a virtual space where people can. Um, so I, I met this woman, um, Ashley, and sh her company is Orbital um, and it's orbital.chat. And, and they basically have virtual, they call them galaxies, but it's essentially like a virtual office and it's audio only. And so you can have your own office and it has a little circle mm -hmm. around it. And anytime someone comes into that circle, they can hear what's going on in the circle. But then when they leave the circle, they can't, okay. you know, and, and whether her solution takes off or, or something else takes off, I, I could see something like that being the option for companies that want to leverage that remote work and, and have people be really happy with being remote, but then also start to capture some of that just knowledge transfer and quick hit, you know, not feeling like you have to schedule time to get answers, being able to just pop in. It was on Facebook a while ago. Um, it was like all the extroverts, we're going back to work. Yay. We're going yeah. back to work. And all the introverts, we have to do everything we do not to go back to work. Right. <laughs> Another company, I think it's a Portland based company. It's called work from, and, and you can have a virtual cafe where people can drop in and they actually have video and, and it's, you know, that's another cool option. Um, but I think you're right. I think, I think the introverts are perfectly happy. Not, yeah. not having that constant interaction with people. Um, so were you remote because of COVID or are you always a remote company? Uh, for easy net. Yeah. Um, so we, you know, my co-founder and I have just recently uh, gone full-time with, e with easy net. So Previously, it was it was balancing it in the evenings and the weekends and, you know, around our our full time jobs. Um, and, and so for that reason, we were already remote. Um, and I think that we'll stay remote for the most part. I did rent myself an office just because I wanted to have space that I could go to that was mine. And um, and, and it does have room for us to have meetings and that kind of stuff. But generally, it's just me in there. Today. And how did COVID affect your company, your startup? Uh, um, well, a lot of our interest before we launched was from uh, senior living communities wanting to add easy net as a resident benefit. And, and by the time we had our product ready to launch, it was April of 2020, and they were a little busy with other things. <laughs> 
And, and so it's just been recently that they've started to talk to us again and, and be like, okay, yeah, we, we do want to talk to you and, and we are open to having those conversations. But even today, at least in, in the Portland area, most of the, the communities are still closed to uh, people coming in. Nick, can you talk about the, you're, you're a member of the Basso Board for the Lincoln for Women. Can you talk about that? What yeah. is that about? And why is that important to you? Um, so the Link for Women uh, has, has been around for 14, no, 15 plus years. And it's really about, um, it was founded by Cindy Tordrici and she is such a connector, you know, I'm, I'm the extroverted introvert, you know, so it's like, I can, I can play nice with other people, but at the end of the day, I'm perfectly happy regenerating, not around other people. She's like the, the epitome of the, of the connector where she wants to bring people together. And it was about vision, voice, and community for women in Portland. And, you know, she basically described it as, um, the female version of the old boys club where, where it gives people a chance to be social and, and create that community and those connections. But you know, as well as I do, a lot of business doesn't get done in the office, doesn't get done in a formal setting. It gets done on the golf course at the bar at the kids baseball game. Exactly. Exactly. And, and it comes back to, you know, what we talked about earlier, people are people. You know, at their at their core, it, it's the humanity. It's the it's that need for community and that need to connect with other people, um, and and that's why I think you see those people wanting to help one another. Oftentimes, happens in a more casual environment versus a formal office space. Exactly. So, two part question. So, you know, those for, for some people like famously work hundred hours a week. You know, other people work forty hours a week. Some people like work three weeks on one day off, like, how do you, how do you work that with yourself? And then how do you take care of yourself? Make sure you take care of yourself. Yeah. Great question. Um, I'm in a, a group called heart spark and it's kind of like the woo woo side of things, but I love it. Um, and, and there they, they call me the queen of self care because I understand you know, I've, I've gotten myself to a point where it's like, I know what my body needs, what my psyche needs to take care of itself. Um, and, and while I do work very, very hard, you know, there's a lot of nights I, but I had to make a commitment. I'm like, okay, I have to shut down my laptop by midnight every night. Like I, I can't keep so what, working what, after what time you shut it down again. Midnight. Midnight. Yeah. I'm like I have to draw a line and be like, okay, laptop has to be, done by midnight. Um, and, and I've learned that I need for myself to be able to have one day a week that I sleep in that, you know, I don't have something in the morning and, and it's usually on the weekend, of course, but you know, it's where, where I can just lay in bed and play on my phone or drink my coffee or, you know, whatever it is and, and just, uh, decompress that way. I also have a subscription to, um, float on Portland. Have you ever done the float tanks? No. Do you know what I'm talking about? No, actually, no. I don't know. <laughs> so they're, um, sensory deprivation tanks. Okay. Okay. I know what that is. Okay. okay. And, and so they put like 2000 pounds of Epsom salts into the water and the water is the same temperature as your skin and the air is the same temperature as your skin. So, you know, you get in there and they, you turn off the lights and it's completely black. So like you said, it's a woohoo stuff. It is, but, but it, it gives your brain just this chance to just kind of like unwind and, and get through the, all the things that have been, I mean, I, I know for myself, there's always those things that I'm like, okay, I have to remember this. Okay. I have to remember this. Okay. I have to remember this. Oh, I need to make sure that I do that. You know? And, and yes, I track those on my phone and stuff, but they're still like in your brain, mm. you know, reminding you. So having 90 minutes of darkness where you're just kind of floating, it gives my brain a chance to unspin that, that ball of yarn and, and get a chance to get to a place where it can truly be creative again 
and, and be able to come up with some of the creative solutions and, um, gives me time to, to focus and, and get myself to a place of like, okay, I'm going to spend as much time as possible in here from a place of gratitude, you know, and, and center back on that. That's a good point. People don't realize how important it is to like have your brain, like be blank every once in a while, right? They always say, you know, listen to podcasts, do this on a, on a routine. Like I try to live, what's the day like this, do nice for 30 minutes, right? It's like let my brain like operate sort of kind of right. I think that's so important. Yeah. I mean, you, the JK Rowling story is pretty famous, mm-hmm. right? Where she was on a train for, I don't know, over 24 hours, I think. And, and basically sat there and, and had this idea for, for this entire storyline. And by the time she was at the end of the train or, you know, the end of her journey, she basically had mapped out the bulk of the pieces yeah. of, of the Harry Potter storyline. So was you shutting down at midnight? It's safe to presume you're, you're a night person versus an early morning person. person. Yeah. <laughs> so you shut down at one at midnight. I guess you go to bed like one in the morning, two in the morning. And when do you get up usually? Uh, usually I'm up about 730. Okay. So you have to get like five, six hours of sleep. Uh, Yeah, I do better when I get about seven hours. So I try to get, you know, if I shut down at 12, you know, I try to be in bed by 1230. And then if I'm getting up at 730, then that's about seven hours. Yeah, mine's like seven hours. I have a good friend, Kiyoki Carruthers. We've been friends so like, he was my first friend in the army. Mm-hmm. We you know, grew up together, you know, he's good friends. This guy, I don't know how he does it. He gets four hours of sleep a day. Ugh, yeah. And I, even a bit of 10, he's up at two. It's like, he's always been like that. He, he could be like, he, we could be like drinking, what a party, whatever, four hours. He's always been like, a couple of times, like sleep five or six hours, but like, and he's gotten mm-hmm. so much done with the extra time, right? I'm like, dude, I'm so jealous of you. <laughs> how, how much sleep do you need? Like seven, seven, seven my sweet yeah. spot. I can get like five, six, you know, but yeah, seven is my sweet spot. Yeah. And if I, if I can do like seven hours and two minutes, I'm, it's, it will, I might fucking no sleep. It's going to be worse. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, I know there are those specific sleep cycles and I know there's an app for that too, right? Probably yeah. more than one. <laughs> yes. So what, how do you like plan your day? I mean, we have so much going on with entrepreneurs. Like, yeah. Like, how do you like focus on what's need to be focused on. Like, how do you like do priority one, two, three versus 100, 101, and 103? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a big fan of the MIT strategy, most important things. So you pick your three MITs for the day. Um, and, you know, and then typically by the time you have your three most important things for a day and then whatever other meetings you have, and then by the time you get through the rest of the stuff, right? Um, but how do you know those are actually the most three important things and not something you just want to work on because they're easy? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think that if you have done a good job, you know, I, I think it starts with certainly annual planning, right? At the start of the year, or the end of the year before, you know, have you gone through, have you set your overarching intentions for the year? And, and have you identified what are the things that are critical, you know, that, that if you did these things, you know that you're going to be where you want to be. Um, and, and then I think when, once you do that and you kind of lay that out, then it's, it's much easier on a week-to-week and a day-to-day basis to identify, okay, what are the pieces that will bring me, move me forward on those, on those key critical items that I've identified will get me where I want to be. Can you talk about the process of how you found your co-founder? Uh, yeah, we were dating at the time. Oh, that makes it easy. <laughs> and <laughs> then we broke not. up and, and we stayed friends and, and now we work really well together, which has been great. You well, know? they say, they say find a co-founder, like find a, a spouse, right? You know, it's so funny. I, I feel like that's generally a concern for investors in particular, right? Because there's so much stress that happens in, in a startup that it can, destroy a relationship right and and which can set the company back um i feel in some ways we're actually stronger having already gone through the breakup mm-hmm. right <laughs> versus versus trying to you know have a, a relationship and a company together and how long have you been doing the company together uh so we founded the company at the end of july of 2018 started development in August of 2018 and then came to market in April of 2020. And real quick, can you talk about any tools you use like day to day, like increase your productivity? Uh, we're of course on Slack. 
Um, how, do, how, do, how do startups exist without Slack, Slack or right? Right. Like how did uh, Amazon start back in the day without Slack? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of sticky notes. No. <laughs> they have stock in 3M. Uh, they, so, so of course Slack. Um, we also have uh, Trello is what we use um, for like our sprints. Um, so the developer and my CTO use, use Trello. Um, and let's see, what else do we use? Uh, you know, of course, marketing software. The video tool that we use that I really like is called Biteable. Biteable, okay. Have you, are you familiar with that no, one I'm at not. all? Um, they make it really easy to make uh, videos. Um, and so are they so they kind of like Loom in that space? No, uh, I, I do use Loom as well. But Loom, I feel like, has a different purpose. Loom, I feel like, is better for um, short videos that you're going to share um, of yourself or screen sharing. This is more where um, you may have an explainer video or you may have a um, animated video that you want to put together. Um, you know, if you watch my pitch next Friday on uh, TechFest, my five minute pitch, I actually did an entire five minute video. Um, and then pitch live to the video. Okay. Um, be, because I feel like it's so difficult to keep attention, you know, it is anyone's attention for five minutes in today is like, got to have it now constant you three know. seconds. You're boring. Let me I, go to my phone. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, did it, did I get a new email? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so I, I use some of their animated sections and, and, you know, so, so I took my pitch deck and basically, made it into um segmented pieces with video backing it and and then pitched to that um and and i guess we'll see next friday how successful that was but <laughs> so, so Aaron, you talk about this a little bit but you can talk more about how you did how you do your customer discovery and idea validation absolutely um so when i first had the idea for easynet it was just um i wanted a password manager that worked the way my brain did because not only are passwords a huge pain in the you know what um i also don't always remember the the url of what i'm going to so you know some of them are obvious right if i'm going to pay my chase credit card i go to chase.com but like I don't know about you. I don't remember the URL for my doctor's office <laughs> or my counselor or my daughter's doctor or, you know, any um, school grades are another one where I'm like, okay, <laughs> how am I getting, you know, where is that again? Um, and so when I had the idea for it originally, it was like, okay, I want everything to be in categories the way my brain works. I want to be able to click on health and doctor and it takes me straight there and autofills my username and password. And EasyNet does do that. Like that is at the core, we, we do do that. Um, but along the way, what we recognized in terms of customer validation and talking to people was this huge missing piece of the rest of your digital estate and, and having a seamless, easy way to pass that on to your loved ones if anything happens. Um, and, and then starting to realize that today, most people don't take care of it and they wind up locking their loved ones out and, and they can't, you know, they, they instantly lose access and then they're having to fight with these companies to try to get back in. You know, they're sometimes it's, it's stuff that you can, if you have to, you know, you call and you get the death certificate and you, you know, it's a bank or something like that and you can still get to the assets, but there's other pieces, you know, whether it's social media or whether it's, um, you know, your, your photos and your videos and all your memories on iCloud, Apple's not going to give that up. If something happens to you, if, if your loved ones don't have your password, they're, they're out of luck unless they go through the entire process of getting a court order and all these things. And even then they drag their feet and sometimes <laughs> won't, won't give up the, the access. So, so it's one of those things where if failing to plan for your digital estate is like trying to buy life insurance after you're dead. Like <laughs> it's, it's not going to have a lot of value. And the person gets to decide who has access to it, all that kind of stuff. Yes, exactly. So you choose your legacy contact. You can have more than one if you want. 
Um, and then they don't have immediate access. They have to request access. And when they do, it sends you a notification. So you have the right to block them from getting access. Um, but, but it's a, you know, they, it sends out a link and it's like, okay, Jason, so-and-so requested access, click here if you don't want them to have it. And the reason for that is if you are incapacitated, now that uh, you're not going to click that link. They just have to wait for the timeout period to expire and then they'll get access. So who's your target customer? Uh, for the most part, it's people that are doing their estate planning um, or have done their estate planning and didn't do this part, <laughs> which is a lot of people. Um, I would say there there is kind of an upper bound where at a certain point, um, if people's uh, functioning has decreased to a point that that they really can't understand technology at all. Um, and, and I typically see that in the 75 to 80 age bracket. Um, they would at least need help from their from their kids or, or yeah. someone. You know, we, we just did a partnership with Tech Trainer who helps seniors with their technology. And, and so you can get an hour of their time to, to help get onboarded. But the bulk of who we target are probably 50 to 70, 75. Now, do y'all give legal advice also? Like, do you say, no. do you say like you should make this person your beneficiary versus someone else? No, we don't do any of that. Um, we do, you know, certainly, so there's federal legislation that came out in 2015 called Ruth Bada, um, and it's the digital assets laws, and it establishes a hierarchy about who gets to um, handle your digital assets. And if you have an online tool where you can change your digital executor in real time, that actually takes the highest priority. Um, and then next is your will or your power of attorney. We do, though, encourage people. I mean, of course, we're not lawyers. You know, consult your own attorney. You know, your mileage may vary. But uh, we do encourage people to list their legacy contact as their digital executor. Or even better, if they already have a digital executor in their will or their power of attorney to have that person be their legacy contact. So how do you do your marketing for this? How are you getting the word out about your company? We're primarily going to market via strategic partnerships. So we're talking to a lot of um, uh, estate planning professionals, uh, pre-need marketing, pre-need funeral marketing companies. Um, but we also have had more and more interest from HR from people that want to add easing as an employee benefit. Um, we have our first uh, company onboarded for that. Um, and and the there's a contract out for our second one. Um, so, so that's one arm, you know, longer term goal would be to join the AARP partner <laughs> network, right? Uh, That'd be big for you. It, it would be huge. Um, and, and there's a couple other avenues that we're pursuing as well, but. So talk some more about the importance of these partnerships. Like, how do you bring them on to you? Like, how do you entice them to be a partner with you? And how is that going to grow your business? Absolutely. So estate planners, for the most part, um, we we do have a partner program set up where we can do a revenue share model. The bulk of estate planning professionals we've talked to are like, we don't care about taking money from you. We just are grateful to have an option for our clients at this point. Um and, and even financial advisors are kind of in that same boat where they have recognized this is a big problem and there hasn't been a good solution. And, and so the ability to give them an, an easy, simple, you know, because the key difference between EasyNet and the other companies that are out there is most of the companies that, that compete with us are going to be on the digital vault side, not the password management side. Um, and, and if you just have a digital vault and you don't have a password management integrated with it, then you have to manually enter every single account and, and then remember to keep it up to date every time you add a new account, every time you uh, change your password. So um, the appeal to estate planners, to financial advisors is, oh, okay, this is something that will just automatically keep things up to date in real time. And my client doesn't have to stress about it anymore. And and we know that the most recent information is what's going to pass to their loved ones. So when someone has like LinkedIn, Facebook, social media accounts, and they pass away, mm -hmm. what happens to accounts that stays in the cloud, quote, unquote, cloud forever on the Facebook platform forever? You, uh, for some of them, you can decide what you want done. 
um, oh, I mean, for all of them, you can somewhat decide what you want done. Uh, Facebook actually has a legacy contact feature. Were you aware of this? No, I wasn't. Yeah, so, so you should go in and, and designate your legacy contact in Facebook. That's your homework for today, Jason. <laughs> uh, and, and there you can say, okay, this is the person who I want to have take over my Facebook account, you know, when, when I'm incapacitated and you can choose to have it memorialized. So then it'll be in memoriam of mm -hmm. okay. Jason Kavnis, or you can have them shut it down. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then if you pre-designate it in advance, I think you also have the ability to download all of your which have you ever done that downloaded yeah, your have, Facebook? I it's have. huge yeah. it's crazy the yeah. amount of stuff is it that's in there anyway um so, so that's facebook and they probably they and google probably have the best um predetermination ability because google has an inactive account manager mm -hmm. so you can choose who would be responsible for your google account afterwards um instagram interestingly uh doesn't have a legacy contact that is interesting. function even though they're owned by facebook they um but you can provide you know documentation a uh, death certificate whatever um or it if you you know ha have designated a, a digital executor then of course that person would would take over um and uh you can have a memorialized account there okay. as well or delete it um Twitter is an interesting one because if you have the username and password, as long as you make it clear that it's no longer that person tweeting, then you can keep the account. You can keep all the followers. What? You can keep all of it. It, it happened with um, Herman Cain last year. Uh, so had, someone's tweeting on Herman Cain's account? Yeah. What? Yeah. They, they changed it to... Um, they basically put, you know, hey, now it's uh, Herman Cain's, you know, family and supporters or what, whatever they listed. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it had to be clear that it's no longer Herman Cain himself yeah. tweeting, um, w which makes sense. Uh, but they let him keep the account. They let him keep all the followers. They let them continue to tweet. Interesting. It, it, it was interesting. Um, so, so that's an interesting case in my opinion tiktok has nothing yeah they're so new they're like we don't know which it <laughs> we're, we're trying to grow <laughs> right <laughs> we're not focused on on who's died yeah um, our people like 18 to 24 exactly <laughs> <laughs> their death rate is much lower they'll be fine uh linkedin just the start of this year like maybe february finally has the ability to memorialize an account mm -hmm. Which I think is positive because there's a lot of people on LinkedIn. You'll know, see, you know, yeah. Oh, it's it's their work anniversary. You should say, you know, congratulations. You're like, well, that would be awkward. Yeah, I know. They've been they've been dead for two years. You tag him, you know, happy birthday, Tom right. Brown. You tag him and stuff. <laughs> people come back. Uh, jackass, he's been dead for a year. <laughs> exactly. Like, uh, thank thanks for your well wishes, but it's a little awkward. Um, yeah. So that that covers most of them. Which ones have I missed? Um. I think you cover most of them. Yeah. So the name of your company, is uh -huh. it is it like just something random you picked? Does that have your meanings? Is there a story behind the name? Yeah. Um, I wanted to make the internet easy to see. And so that's the reason. So it's E-A-S-E-E-N-E-T. Um, so the combination of easy to see, you know, okay. is, is easy net. Um, that's why we have little, if you look at our logo, we have little eyebrows on the E's. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, that that's been our goal from the start. Is like we want to make internet more friendly and you know user friendly, really, uh, for people of all ages, but especially people that didn't grow up with technology. Now, is this a platform? Is it an app? A combination of both, or what? Actually, it's is both. It? So we have a browser extension built for Chrome, for Firefox, for Microsoft Edge. Um, we have our iPhone app is live in the App Store. Um, We've been working on the Android app. We're at about 85, 90% ish. Um, so, you know, hopefully we'll get some funding soon and be able to to finish building that out and, you know, fine tune the, there, there's always things, more things to do on technology, you know, you yeah. know, you build um, something Unfortunately out. I do. Yeah. <laughs> yours is, yours is app and yeah. desktop, it was, it was, right? it was both of them, yeah. Yeah. 
can you talk about the process, like how long this journey takes, right? You know, like, you know, that, you know, oh, start a company, six months be, you know, marked a million dollars or whatever. Can you talk about how long the process talk takes, especially for building a tech product, right? Like, yeah. Um, so the first thing we did was kind of, you know, of course, went and talked to a bunch of people. We we kind of um and, you, and your co-founders, he's also a CTO. Yes, okay. Andrew. Okay. Um, and so Andrew and I, uh, he worked on kind of making a straw man, you know, basically just kind of making the a very rough stuff like that framework for it and be like, okay, you know, what would this look like? Is do we believe that that we can build this? Right. And and if we build it, is it something that would be valuable to people? Um, and and once we we'd established that and and then rolled into development, right? Then um learned very quickly that it is much harder to build a password manager <laughs> than we might have thought. Uh I you know, I, I've been in technology a long time, but I guess I had always thought that the fields on a web page are identified in some way. So, you know, your username and password field would be identified in the back end code as a username and password field. This made sense to me. And that's just not the case. So so can you talk about how do, how do you, for your company, how do you work through the product roadmap? Is that all on your CTO does that all? Do you have input on that? How does the product roadmap work for your company? Uh, as the CEO, I do uh, jump in sometimes. I'm like, nope, nope, we're going to prioritize this. Um, but by and large, you know, yeah, he he does a lot of the prioritization and, and building out the roadmap. But, you know, of course, we, we're constantly talking to customers. We're hearing what they need. Um, one of the, the pieces that we built out, the ability to securely share documents between different EasyNet users, uh, that was a request from a financial advisor because he said, hey, my clients are a little bit older and, and having secure email messages and, and having to navigate that is really challenging for them. You know, could, could there be a way that I could share documents and they could share documents with me? securely through through your system and so we built that out um and and i think that 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 was a really positive add um but but certainly you know we we have our backlog we know what we're working on and and andrew and i for the most part stay pretty tight-knit on on what it is that we're working on is this something that when you first started the journey that you thought you would have on the on the platform like yeah this is gonna be on the platform and we're gonna love it and then like man no one wants this let's take it off yep. <laughs> Did I prompt you with that question? <laughs> uh, so one of the features that that we added was journaling. So the ability to have uh, your memories and your stories. And I was like, well, we should put a journal prompt on the the dashboard. And that way, you know, when uh, when someone comes for the day and they're they're navigating around the website or, you know, navigating out to whatever website they were going to go to, there, there's a question there that can prompt them and, you know, spur their mind to, to answer. And first of all, nobody used it. And second of all, half the people thought it was like a security question. <laughs> 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 They're like, oh, I thought that was a security question. I'm like, oh, no. So so we wound up taking that off. Um, the, you know, we I, there was also we thought that in terms of onboarding, um, that our demographic would really want something that was like a step-by-step -step instructions. Mm -hmm. And so we built out this really nice wizard that went, you know, step one, step two, step three, and, and really walked you all the way through it. And then what we found was that um, people would literally just click out of it. They, they just wanted to get to the product and, and play with it. So a um, few months ago, we redesigned and, and went to a tour design instead. So there is still like a quick pop-up when you first, you know, log into your account for the first time to download your browser extension and, and it'll, will give you a tour if you choose to, to go through those different steps, it'll point out different things on your dashboard, but, um, it, it's not the, the full on step-by-step -step wizard okay. with videos and that kind of stuff. Cause we just found nobody wanted that. They, they just want to jump right to it. So hopefully that's helpful for you as you, as yes, you continue yes. to build. So not to get too techy, but yeah, uh, and, and don't give me any secrets. But how do you decide your your tech platform? How like how do you like figure out to be is it like code on Python or Ruby on Rails on you know on AWS Google Cloud? Like how do you work through all that kind of tech tech techy stuff, so to speak? Um, 
That I definitely turned over to Andrew. Okay. I was like, you said, here, Andrew, you got that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, he'd worked in a number of different uh, languages mm-hmm. and, and styles and, um, and, and did some research, you know, with our developer and mm-hmm. we're like, okay, what's going to fit us the best. And certainly then, of course, when we went to start building the iPhone and Android app, you know, then it was another conversation about, okay, what's the best way to affect this? What's the best way to, um, anytime we do an update, not have to copy a whole bunch of code into different, you know, styles, different languages, because I mean, let's face it, the, the more times you make a copy of something, the more chance of making a mistake yeah. and, and accidentally introducing a bug or, um, whatever. So I know that we've minimized that. I couldn't tell you what it's built. On. No problem. No worries. <laughs> Sorry. If you if you want to talk to Andrew, I'd be more than happy. You know, for for you in particular, right, to be able to ping him and and pester him with questions. I'm cool. happy to do that. So next, no, it's hard to start a company, but I think people understand understand how hard it's like bringing people on the team, right? You're like convincing like yeah. quote unquote work for free, work for equity was like really like you know, is it going to get it? No. So how did you like convince people? Could, could, join your team? Um, again, you know, so far it, I've been lucky because I, my network has been such that people have, you know, when I, when I reach out for great people, um, they, they get introduced to me by, by people in my network. They're like, Oh, this person would be great for that. Um, and, and of course, you know, like, like anything, storytelling is important and helping people see, okay, what is your vision? What are you driving towards? What, where, where is this going to be in a few years? Of course, it's important in fundraising. It's also important in staffing. Yeah. And, and I think that's true if done right, that's true at any organization of any size. Cause even very large organizations, if the hiring manager is able to really create that that vision, right. And, and help someone who they're interviewing, you know, understand what is the vision, what are we creating here? Why is it important? Why, why does it matter at the end of the day, what you're working on, Mm -hmm. then, then you're going to be much more likely to attract top talent versus if you're just like, okay, here's a salary. Do you want the job? Do you not want the job? Right. That's, That's very true. Um, we might have covered this already, but you can talk about like, of course, you're not, a, you're not a, 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 a nonprofit. No. How are you making money? Like, how are you monetizing this? Yeah. So uh, we have a subscription model. So it is SaaS. Um, and uh, our consumer price is, is $60 a year um, or $6 a month, you know, five ninety five a month. Um, we've, of course, offer bulk rates for companies that want to work with us on the employee benefits side or, um, and for uh, senior living communities that want to add this as, as a resident benefit. Um, you know, and talking with senior living communities, they're already spending six to eight hours a month per community helping their residents change their passwords and with technology. I, so, I, I'm not surprised. No, no, no. Can you believe it's up to 70 as of last year, 77% of people over 70 years old have a smartphone. Yeah. That sounds about right. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then it jumps to in, in your sixties, it's 85%. And then in the fifties, it was like 92%. So it's like, that's what's coming. Right. Is everyone is, has a mobile device that's tied to the internet. And, and so, and, and that's still a lot of people who didn't grow up with technology, that it's not native for them. Yeah. I think a lot of people that age, they're learning like, I have to get a smartphone to be on Facebook to communicate with my grandkids or yep. just to be right. Yep. Yeah. Facebook doesn't make it easy by the way. So I deleted the app off my phone mm-hmm. because you know, the tracking and everything. And so I would still go there on my browser, but you can't access Facebook Messenger without their app mm, on your phone. They don't that. allow you to do it. It's, it's probably smart on their part, though. Oh, of course it is. They want you to have all their apps, right? Uh, but it's just interesting to see, you know, when you do start to limit what you put um, out in the world, 
how, how the different strategies that they employ to try to get you to give them more information. <laughs> yeah. What's, what's, cause someone said or somewhere like, you know, if it's free, it means you're probably the, the product, right? That's exactly it. You are the product. Your information is the product. If you're not paying for the product. So far, who's been like your most surprising customer? You've had like someone sign up, like you wouldn't, you, like you want to target them, so to speak, like they sign on for that. Like you're kind of surprised. Uh, ooh, good question. Let me think about that. Um, well, they've all been in the relatively same space. Somewhat, you know, I, I had a guy this week, he was a referral from, uh, from one of my other cu customers and he, he's just like, Oh, I need this. And I was like, okay. So we, you know, he wanted to have a quick call, you know, and he was a referral. So I was happy to do it. And and he was just like, okay, yep, yep, yep. And like, he was up and running. Like it was a phone call. It wasn't even a zoom call. We had yeah. him up and running and done in like eight minutes or something like that. So easy sale. It was super easy. Um, but you know, clearly he understands technology better than, than some of the clients that we work with, <laughs> but, but he also clearly saw the value in just having it all handled and all settled and taken care of. So, um, you know, those are the clients that, that are certainly the easiest to work with, but I would say the most fulfilling ones to work with are the ones that maybe didn't grow up with technology. And then when they see what we have, they're like, wow, you guys thought of everything and, oh, this is so easy. Right. And, and it, it actually makes technology more friendly for them. So it's like, even though those people of course take longer to onboard and, and a little more handholding, it's so satisfying to see them up and running. Now, is your company across the United States or you just, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. United States and Canada both have digital asset laws at this point. Um, beyond those, you know, then it's, it's a country by country basis. So, so when you first started, do you, like, do you go do the platform across the United States or do you like do Portland first and expand or is like United States all at once? Um, so a couple of things that we did last year were sponsoring estate planning conferences because that really put us right in the flow for all of these estate planners. Um, so one of the ones we did was a national uh, NAEPC, National Association of Estate Planners. Um, and so that was more national, but then there was also EPC Portland um, that we did. And so that was really just Portland. Um, so so it's, it's definitely been a blend. Um, I would say we have more of our traction so far is in Portland just because that's where yeah. we're headquartered and those are the you know some of the people we know but we're constantly getting introduced to to people elsewhere um one financial advisor that I worked with is up in Alaska and I adore her she's just wonderful uh, Christina Gamash and um she she's super enthusiastic about what we're doing she put us in her newsletter and she's like all my clients need to have this um but, you know, that that just, you know, it's introduction after introduction. I mean, I, I'm sure you find the same, same for, thing, for yeah. you, right? Yeah. Although our, our HR laws is such that you have to be the, really the, specific. The, the, yeah, about, they're, they're different everywhere. Yeah. Like here in the state of Washington, Seattle has a set, Tacoma has a set, and the rest of Washington has a set, right? So do you have to be more careful then when you start to build out your product? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. I mean, you can't, like... Those companies in Seattle, you can't extend them or deploy a handbook will be like someone from like, you know, Tacoma, right? Oh, wow. Yeah. That's specific. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. That's a lot of research for you. Yeah. Yeah. But hey, someone got to do it right. <laughs> it's true. And we appreciate you Thanks. for it, for sure. So you already talked about your company some, but can you talk in like more detail, that, you know, like the how and why it got started? Yeah. Where is that at right now? And what's your vision for it? Like maybe five, 10 years from now, like you want to, you know, be a IPO, be in our mm -hmm. company, like what's your vision? Yeah. So, um, how we got started was really, uh, we started from the password manager side and then, and then realized that there was this gaping hole in the digital vault side. So, um, at this point we are the only product in the market, at least as far as I know that, that combines a password manager with the digital vault. Um, for kind of that all-in-one digital estate planning tool. Um, we don't do your will. We don't do your power of attorney. You know, go to your attorney, go to, you know, wherever you want to go to for that. But um, we will store, um, organize and store 
your passwords, your documents, um, you know, there's that document sharing that I alluded to, journaling, um, and then and then there's a legacy worksheet to capture all the critical life details that people just forget to pass on. Everything from what medications do you take to what's your phone password to have you hidden money in the house anywhere? If so, where? Um, you know, just just write down the line. But we tried to make it as streamlined and simple as possible because if you make it too difficult, people just won't do it, and then you've lost all the value, right? Um, so that's really what, what we created. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to market primarily through strategic partnerships and, and where I like to see us be five to 10 years from now. Um, I, I want us to be the de facto solution for people that are taking care of this. Cause I recognize people are seeing what a big need this is. People are going to find some way to deal with this. We, you know, of course I'm biased. I'm the CEO, but I, I, from everything that I've seen and all the people I talk to, right. They all say, look, you guys are the easiest way to consolidate this. It's, you know, it's elegant, it's clean, it's simple. Um, and, if, and I believe if we're the de facto solution for that, right. Then regardless of what our outcome is, we'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, be, because as, as digital estate planning becomes more and more ubiquitous and, and there's more and more people taking care of it, right. Um, whether ultimately we, we get bought or ultimately we go IPO or regardless of, of what the ultimate outcome is, I have no doubt that, that our company and our investors will, will be just fine <laughs> in the end. So going back to the, uh, the winery that you did yesterday, yeah, you had a quote on there set up. I think it's a work harder, play harder. Yes. What does that mean? Uh, to me, I think that a big part of your life is that playfulness. I mean, that that's huge for, for who I am as a person. Like I have to have that playful mm -hmm. element or else I won't be at my best. I won't show up at my best anywhere. I won't show up at my best out of work, but I also won't show up at my best in work. So you know, and, and I think that that also f feeds into why my teams have been so loyal over the years is it's like, I recognize that if you show up and, and you do a good job at work and then you go and play and you play, at, you know, harder than you've been worked, then you're going to show up that much better when you show up back at work. And you know, I, I think all the studies for HR have shown this, right? Yeah. People who don't take vacation, who don't breathe, that, that their brain doesn't have a chance to unwind that, that ball of yarn that we talked about. Um, they're, they're not going to show up as their best selves. And, and ultimately, you know, I think it work hard, play harder. I've always believed in that because I believe that when, when you work hard, then you get the results you want. And then you go and play harder, which allows you to regenerate and, and be, you know, and then show up back at work as your best self. And then you can be more efficient and, and accomplished in a shorter amount of time working. And, and then that cycle just continues. So it allows you to spend more time in that playful. So how do you do the balance line? for yourself, your people, you know, how do you say, okay, it's time to work hard, time to play hard. Like how do you do that balance? Like how do you decide what to do? Yeah. So I, I think you kind of have to figure it out over time. I don't think it's an instant um, thing, but, but I think, you know, we talked a little bit at the, at the beginning about recognizing how your people want to feel honored, how they want to, you know, what, whether it's um, having them stand up in front of everyone and be like, Oh, we're giving you an award or whether it's, Hey, there's extra cash or Hey, there's extra time off, you know, know what drives your people um, because that's going to help you as far as establishing that balance between what is work hard, play harder look like for your team. Um, you know, my team at Integra, we were very, we were a very tight knit group. Um, and, and so they all like to hang out together. So a lot of times that work hard, play harder would look like, okay, we'll, we'll incorporate more team events and, um, I could tell some, some crazy stories, but, 
um, you know, typically at the start of every month, we'd be like, okay, well, if we exceed our quota, like what, what do you guys want the prize to be? And, and one month it was, they wanted me to eat the, the Costco chocolate cake, <laughs> the, and, and I don't know if you know this, you know, the really rich, the, uh-huh. the super rich chocolate cake. Um, of course they did hit quota that month. And, and so I went to Costco to get my chocolate cake that I had to eat. Um, that thing is seven pounds. I didn't realize that was big. I did I not it either. Big, but I didn't that big. Yeah. So, so I get there and I'm like, you know, getting my chocolate cake and I look down, I'm like seven pounds of chocolate cake and I have to eat this thing in a day. I didn't make it by the way. Um, which, you know, ultimately it, but, but there are some great pictures, uh, out there in the, in the internet <laughs> world of my attempts at, at eating a seven pound chocolate cake in a day. So Aaron, are you a wine person? I do love wine. Yeah. What do you have like a go-to uh, so I'm a member at Domains Terrain, which is in Dundee, Dundee Hills. Um, and they have really nice Pinot Noirs, um, especially their single vineyards. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those you, you can't necessarily just go get at the grocery store. Right. Um, but, uh, I also am a sucker for a really good New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc because I love the passion fruit and the bright. Are you, are you a wine guy? Sort of kind of. Yeah. Yeah. What's your go-to? So when I was in the army in Italy, I was there for two years with the family. Uh-huh. We shipped 300 bottles of Italian wine with us. Back th- <gasps> wow. But this is like back 2003, right? And of course, we gave away some gifts, drunk some. And so I think we had like maybe 20 bottles, right? And if I drink one, the penalty is pretty much like death, right? Because my wife wow. is like, you're not drinking any more of this wine, right? <laughs> the final thing was like, what are you doing giving away? It's this wine. You got to drink it. Like, no. So now it's like, even look at the wine box. It's like a little wine thing mm-hmm. in, the, in, in the living room, whatever. Yeah. If we ever like go toward like, what are you doing? Get away from there. Yeah. But I, I get Merlot's. I, of course, you first started out like a big, what's it called? The the dessert wine. I can't think of the, the name for it, right? Oh, the the white no, wine? Yeah, the Moscato. Yeah. Of course, I first started out a big Moscato guy, you know, sweet wine. Now it's like more like Merlot now. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I do feel like most people, they'll start with the sweeter when they're younger. And yeah. then as you as you get older, then you have more of an appreciation for um, my sales guy yesterday, he kept talk- calling it the funk. <laughs> he's like, he's like, I love the funk. <laughs> I was like, all right, well. Uh, so is Portland is, is a big wine area down there? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Primarily Pinot Noirs. Okay. So um, that region, especially, you know, Dundee Hills and kind of that area, um, roughly at the same latitude as um, the Pinot region in mm-hmm. France. And kind of similar climate. And so, um, you know, the, the soil, the, the climate, the elevation and everything is, is somewhat similar. Um, and so you wind up getting really nice Pinot Noirs coming out of, of that area. Have you ever been to Westport, Washington? It's like right on the coast, big, big fishing community. I think I have, but not since I was probably a teenager. So there's a winery right there called Westport Winery. It's mm-hmm. like, in, it's the middle of nowhere. It's, it has a great wine there. It's like, it's like nice. literally like you go on like 30, 40 miles. Like this, the building pops up. Like, what is this? Interesting. It's out of nowhere. They're pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll have to make it up there one of those days. What are their, what are they known for there? <sighs> I haven't been there for a while. Okay. I can tell you. Every time I go there, I have like different things going on. Right. Yeah. Of course, it's like way pre-COVID. So I, I can tell you. Well, I feel like there's bigger, bolder um, grapes. That come out of Washington versus mm-hmm. Oregon. Oregon tends to be that more delicate Pinot Noir yeah. grape. It, you know, succeeds really well versus Washington has more of like the, the really bold, yeah. um, bolder flavored grapes. So Aaron, is there anything that I, 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 I haven't asked you that I should ask you? Is there anything else you want to talk about? Oh gosh. Let's see. Good question. I mean, we could talk for hours, right, about whatever, but um, I, you know, I definitely want to give a shout out to, to my daughter, but then all, really all the teenagers that have made it through this last year and kids in general. Like, I mean, I know they say kids are resilient and everything, but man, you know, at, at least adults have had a lot more years of living in a non-COVID world right so we kind of I it's a less of a percentage of our lives that was spent in this pandemic Mm -hmm. environment but for kids for teenagers I feel like this has been 
it, you know, for, for my daughter who just turned 14, we're talking about like 10% of her life, right. Has spent in lockdown, so to in speak. lockdown and in this pandemic reality. Um, and it, it can't be easy. And a lot of these kids have done such a great job just keeping their spirits up and, and making it through and, you know, adapting to this new reality and adapting to, um, online schooling and, and, you know, having to, to figure out how to stay connected and tapped into their own communities. But I think there's also going to be a lot of work left to do as parents, especially and communities in terms of helping these kids that now have reshaped how they interact with their mm -hmm. community and being able to bring them back to interacting in person and rebuilding those social skills that, that they haven't tapped into for a while. Do you hear about this as a while ago? I think it's an AEO kid somewhere. He figured out like he did a video of himself, right? So instead of like being in front of the zoom camera every day of school, mm -hmm. he did a video of himself, right? And post a video on the Zoom, mm -hmm. and then he set up the microphone so he could answer questions anywhere in the house, right? Oh, so the teachers funny. saw this video of him like interacting, like doing stuff, right? Yeah. It was like, man, this guy, yo, kid, figure this out. There was, there's a couple of videos. I think they're more um, high schoolers or maybe even college, but where they were just messing with their teachers, uh -huh. like, like somebody on the Zoom call would be like, "Hey, can I borrow a, a pencil?" And then, and then they like video the the screen and it looks like one person is passing it to the next person over. Yeah. Right. And then that person looks like they're taking that pen, you know, then they have a pencil and then they pass it up. So it like goes around <laughs> the entire class of 25 people, you know, just kind of fun stuff like that, where clearly they, they still manage to keep their sense of humor. They still manage to create that sense of community. Um, you know, I feel a little bad for the teacher because I think it was kind of at her expense, but you know, they managed to mm. create that still, which I think is so cool. And yeah. it'll be interesting to see as we start to come out of that, um, what things stay the same and what, what things are, are totally different yeah. and, and we'll never go back. I could never imagine being school day saying, I won't go back to school. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, are you kidding me? I, I can be home for vacations and like, right. it's, like it's not, it's not always as packed up to be though. No, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And my, you know, as, as I've just started to travel again, you know, for easy net and, um, my daughter's like, okay, well now I can go with you. Right. Cause she's still doing virtual school and, and she can do that from anywhere. So that's been a good point. Like everyone says remote work this from over that. Right. Yeah. Right. But this really wasn't, it was not remote work, you know, like it was, you know, remote work supposed to, you go home, you work in your job, you have a desk, whatever. It's not, take care of your kids, take care of your parents, you know, yeah. all this stuff COVID through us, right? So I don't really think those remote work to a true sense. Like you're doing your job. Like that, it was on a, I saw somewhere where this guy was leaving like a Zoom call, right? Mm -hmm. And on the side, these two kids came by, they started making a cake mm -hmm. right there. He's looking like, do yeah. I stop them? Do I do the business? Do I stop them? What I'm doing? And I'm like, yeah, it was so hilarious. Well, and, and I think that, one thing we have seen through the pandemic, which has been so positive, has been it, it's been more okay to bring your humanity, your mm -hmm. your whole self into work. So you're seeing people's dogs and cats and kids and parents and spouses, right? Because it's just everybody's at home. Like those people are are part of your life and they're gonna be part of part of what you see. Um and, and I, I think that that's been positive. I think also starting to recognize that people can have, um, it's not work-life balance, right? Cause it's never a true balance, yeah. but, but you can, if you do it right and you have the right personality for it, you can really kind of stir the pot a little bit and mix your, your work and your personal in a way that, that creates a schedule that's optimized for your working style and and how you can best be you know show up as your best self yes and one thing i was talking about culture like like you have a work hard play harder culture right yes if someone doesn't isn't down for that they're not a good fit for your company right right and if somebody needs a uh, micromanager i am not <laughs> <laughs> i'm not the person for that you know i i think that that 
I, I would always much rather hire somebody who has that self drive. Right. And, and you can tell them, Hey, this is where we're going. You know, can you help me chart a path to get there? And they get fired up about that. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I want to do that. I'm, you know, I'm psyched about that as opposed to someone that's like, okay, well, I need you to like draw on the map exactly where you want me to to go to get from point A to point B. Or even worse, step one, step one, a step one, B, exactly. Step one, you know, get your car keys. Step two, find your car. Step three, open your car, right? <laughs> As opposed to being like, hey, take that car and yeah. I need you to get it to wherever. Exactly. So, Aaron, understand you have something for listeners today. I do. Yeah. Um, so, you know, obviously, EasyNet is, is growing and uh, we'd love to have you join our community. So for listeners that want to uh, join us on EasyNet, love to offer you three months free. So when you go to EasyNet, and again, it's E-A-S-E-E-N-E-T dot com. Uh, and, and when you go to sign up, there's a, there's a code section. And if you put in the code ESTATE3, so that's E-S-T-A-T-E, the number three. Um, so like estate planning, so estate three, that'll give you three free months uh, of EasyNet. So you can join and try it out and see what you think. And, and I welcome your feedback. You can, you know, send that uh, to us and, and whether it's positive or negative, we, we love it all. So um, looking forward to seeing, seeing more people in our community and, and thank you so much for having me on. This has been a blast. I've, I've yes. enjoyed the conversation very much. Thanks, Aaron. And Aaron, yeah. can you share your social media for, for yourself and your company? Absolutely. So um, generally you can find me at uh, Aaron in PDX, E-R-I-N-I-N-P-D-X. Uh, PDX is the airport code for Portland. So Aaron okay. in PDX, um, that's on Twitter. Um, that's on Instagram. Um EasyNet is generally just at EasyNet, again, E-A-S-E-E-N-E-T. Um, although on Instagram, we're at EasyNet Official. And do you have a, a favorite social media platform? Um, I've been working on moving to Twitter. It's a slow move, right? Because the bulk of the people that I'm connected to, I'm either connected on LinkedIn or, or Facebook. And so it's a, it's a shift. But Yeah, I'm the same way. Because Twitter is like a lot of HR people on there and a lot of VCs on Twitter too, a lot of investors on Twitter. So I got to do a better job of that. Yeah. So um, I know that there's strategies to to build my network there. It takes a lot of time that I don't necessarily have right now. So it's, it, it is building. It's just, you know, building slow. Um, so the we right now probably see the most engagement on LinkedIn um, for myself personally, as as well as for EasyNet. Um, but but we're working on we're working on the Twitter thing. And to our listeners, we'll have the link to our GIF and our, and our uh, social media links on our show notes. Perfect. You find the show notes at www.cabinetstatesoverlock.com. Be sure to share this episode of the podcast with their, their networks and be sure to check us out on YouTube or Twitch. All right, Aaron, uh, this has been a great talk, but we're just coming to the end of now. Yeah. Can you give us advice or wisdom on anything you want to talk about? Uh, always fail faster, right? Um, I think the biggest lesson I ever learned was what, and it was such an aha moment for me was uh, somebody drew a stick figure in on a page and they said most people think that success and failure are two opposing forces on you so you're either getting pulled towards success or you're getting pulled towards failure and in reality it's not that way right so then they redrew the the stick figure and and but the stick figure and then failure and then success right and and so that's that's your path to success is is recognizing that you're gonna fail a bunch of times and and that's actually propelling you on your path to success Aaron, thank you for your time today i really appreciate it yeah thank you thank you so much and to our listeners thank you for your time as well remember to be great every day